Our first plenary talk today is by Olio Ross from University of Würzburg. He's going to talk a boundary version of the old horse Nihari Schwartz lemma. Olio, please. Yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Shabbat. And uh, I want to say a big thank you to the organizers, in particular Shabbat and uh, Ilya, for putting so much energy into this project. So it's a, it's a great service for, for complex analysis, and we, we really appreciate this. And uh, I would also uh, like to uh, uh, excuse myself. I have given a couple of lectures in the last year about a topic which is somehow related to what I'm going to talk about. But actually, I tried to put in uh, more new material. So I hope uh, that there's uh, a lot of new stuff for anybody of you, uh, even if you might have heard one of these earlier uh, talks. So my, my apologies for that. So. Um, Okay, so here's one way how to, uh, to find an, a start of what we are interested in. Ah, I have to say, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a great honor to uh, uh, mention my co-authors, uh, two good friends of mine, Filippo Bracci from Rome and Daniela Kraus from Würzburg. Uh, okay, sorry. So, so here's the problem. So it's about uh, detecting inner functions of Lushby products. So it's, uh, it's close to the topic of the workshop, of course. So what we are doing is we, we start uh, with a holomorphic self map uh, of the open unit disk D, which we call F. And then uh, a natural question is whether this uh, function F is say an inner function or even a Blaschke product, or maybe even better, a finite Blaschke product. Then there is a variant of this problem, namely you give a second function, call it capital B, and say, well, you already know that B is an inner function, or maybe a Blaschke product, or even better, a finite Blaschke product. And then you want to decide whether your given self map F is identical to this other function, capital B, say up to a certain normalization. Uh, and our normalization will be a conformally invariant normalization. So we will use uh, post compositions by disk automorphisms as a, a type of normalization. Okay, and the main point now is that we actually allow information about our given function f only at one single point. And, and the classical, uh, well, the grandfather of uh, much of complex analysis is also the starting point of, of this uh, lecture, namely the sports lemma is actually a, a way to detect the identity map. So a very simple Blaschke product, the identity function, Namely, uh, if you recall this classical statement, if you fix a point P in the open unit disk, okay, and if your given self map F looks like the identity at this point P up to first order terms, then the self map is already identical to the identity. So this is a very strong rigidity result. It's the Schwartz lemma, one way to formulate it, the case of equality. And it's a, a, an astonishing fact that it took many, many years that uh, before uh, Burns and Kranz came up with a boundary version of this Schwartz lemma. And what they did was they replaced this interior point P uh, by a boundary point of the unit disk. And then they proved, again, if your self map F looks like the identity now at this boundary point P, but now up to third order terms, then again, you have the same conclusion that F is the identity. Here, this critical exponent three is sharp and the usual way to show this is just to write down an example that demonstrates this. And in all the textbooks, you essentially find the same function. It's even a polynomial of degree three demonstrating that the result of Burns and Kranz is sharp. But what us actually bothered quite a while is what is the geometric significance of this critical exponent three? I mean, okay, you can write down this counter example, but okay, there should be some geometrical reason. And uh, we were looking for a, a reason in terms of hyperbolic geometry. And because of this, of course, we uh, uh, looked again at the in conformally invariant version of the Schwartz lemma, everybody knows the Schwartz-Pick lemma. 
And this is a, actually a way now to detect disk automorphisms of the, of the unit disk, right? So here's some standard formulation. Again, you pick a point P in the interior of the unit disk. And if this equality here holds at the single point P, then the function F is an automorphism. Well, everybody knows that this is just the case of equality in the Schwartz peak inequality here. And it will prove very convenient to introduce a notation for this expression that oops, occurs here on the left hand side of the Schwartz peak inequality, be denoted by FH. And this is, and it actually it is, it's the Euclidean hyperbolic derivative of this self map F of the open unit disk. Okay, and then we can slightly reformulate this interior Schwartz pick lemma so that it looks a little bit more similar to the previous results we have seen. So, namely, we just take the denominator here and multiply it to the left hand side. So, then the expression on the left is equal to one. So, one way to write this down in a slightly maybe overcomplicated way is this expression here. Okay, so FH is exactly the left hand side of the Schwartz pick inequality. You multiply by the denominator of the right hand side. And then if this expression tends to one, if Z goes to the point B, then the function F is an automorphism. So that's a, a way to write down the uh, case of equality in the interior Schwartz pick lemma. And uh, this particular form now has the advantage that you can replace the boundary point P by, uh, I'm sorry, the interior point P by a boundary point. And then uh, this is actually already the first result I want to show. It's a kind of boundary version of the Schwartz peak lemma. And it says that if you have the same condition as in the interior Schwartz peak lemma, but with a slightly stronger error term here, and if you let Z go to this boundary point P, then under this condition, uh, the function f actually is an automorphism of the open unit disk. Okay, and uh, the advantage of this boundary schwartz pick lemma is that it is a conformally invariant statement. But again, the question, of course, is what about this exponent two now in this error term? Uh, the first observation is this error term is again sharp, and it's very simple to write down an example. It's a Blaschke product of degree two. But again, the question is the same as before. What is the significance of this number two? And this question is interesting because it turns out, and this is not difficult to prove, that this theorem one, this boundary Schwartz pick lemma, actually includes the Schwartz lemma of Burns and Krenz. Okay, so this would mean that explaining the significance of this error term here in this boundary Schwartz pick lemma would also give us a way to explain the significance of the error term in the Burns Kranz theorem. And why is this true? Well, this is very simple. Um, it's just an exercise, actually. So if you start with a self map F of the disk that satisfies the condition of the Burns Kranz theorem, this is this expression here, then it's not difficult to show that uh, just using the Cauchy integral formula for the derivative of F, that the expression which we have in our boundary schwartz pick lemma uh, has this particular form, at least non-tangentially, okay? And this actually suffices to uh, use theorem one because there it actually is sufficient that you choose just one sequence of points set that goes to this boundary point P, no matter if it goes tangentially or non-tangentially, and if you choose it to converge non-tangentially, then the error term in theorem one and the one you get from the Cauchy integral formula, these are just the same. Okay, so um, actually one can uh, subsume these two results. So the interior case and the boundary case of the Schwartz pick them are in just one single statement. And I want to rephrase this in terms of uh, Blaschke products of degree one, which are a fancy way of saying that you have an automorphism. And for an automorphism of the disk, call it capital B, it's simple to, uh, very easy to compute the, this Euclidean hyperbolic derivative. This is this expression here. And then uh, our theorem one now can be restated 
just in the form I have written down here. So now the distinguished point P is a point either in the disk, in the open disk or on the boundary. And if there is a Plushkin -like product of degree one, call it B, so that the hyperbolic derivative of the self map F is the same as the hyperbolic derivative of B in the sense of this limit relation, if you tend to this boundary point P, then F is a Plushkin -like product of degree one. Okay. So in other words, this is somehow to say how to detect whether this given self map F coincides with this given Plushkin -like product of degree one and actually, this is just a restatement of the schwartz pick lemmas, the interior or the boundary case we have seen just on the previous slide. Okay, I have to say that as uh, soon as you know that a result of this type is known, uh, there are many ways to prove it. So it can be deduced from quite classical work of Colucci, but it can also be deduced from beautiful a series of papers by Alan Bearden and David Minter, where they introduced this business of multi-point schwartz pick inequalities. And uh, there have been many papers recently that deal with those aspects. So in particular by Lain Baribo, Vivar, Elias Wegert, uh, Show, Seong Akim and Oshisugawa and Marco Abate. But the point of view today is a bit different. So what we will see, and this will lead us to a setting of uh, finite Plushke products and also uh, infinite Plushke products in a minute, that this theorem one actually can be seen as a special case of a very general rigidity result for conformal metrics. And there are other special cases of this general result. One is a boundary version of the Alpha's Schwartz lemma. But, and that will be the focus of the lecture today, there is this boundary version of another very well-known classical result, so-called nehari schwarz lemma And this will be the focus of the lecture today, but we will have two goals in mind. So what we will try to do is, we want to extend this theorem one from Plushke products of degree one to finite Plushke products, then at least to certain classes of infinite Plushkin products. And we will also indicate a way how possibly generalize this to inner functions. But this will be, will, I, I think, provide a bridge to the next talk, uh, which is given by Orlik. And then the other more modest goal will be to try to give you a, a geometric explanation of this critical exponent in these error terms. Um, okay, so let's start by taking a look at this classical Nehari Schwartz lemma. So it is not that well known as the Schwartz lemma itself, unfortunately. So, as we have learned by the lecture of Artur, usually people uh, write down Blaschke products in terms of their zeros. Yeah, so, there is, if you focus on the finite case, this is the familiar formula here. Uh, but actually what you can also do, and this is a bit more geometric, uh, you can also use the critical points of a holomorphic self map or of a Blaschke product instead of the zeros to uh, prescribe them. And this goes back to uh, work of Nehari and Heinz and many others. In this slightly unusual way to think about finite Blaschke products, is quite uh, useful, for instance, in some questions in complex dynamics, but it is actually necessary if you want to extend those concepts, say, to the world of circle packing, because in the discrete world of circle packing, zeros of holomorphic, discrete holomorphic functions doesn't make any sense, but critical points or critical structures do. And okay, so this is one motivation maybe to, to look at those this slightly different perspective. Okay, and we will denote the Blaschke products of degree n by BPN now. And, and then there is this following nice result. So it says that if you take n minus one points in the open unit disk, okay, then you can find a Blaschke product B of exact degree n 
which has exactly those points z1 up to zn minus 1 as its critical points, so at the zeros of the first derivative. And this, we count multiplicities here, of course. And this finite Blaschke product is uniquely determined, determined by those critical points up to a post composition by disk automorphisms. Because post composition by disk automorphisms, of course, doesn't change the critical points of a map. Okay, so this means there is actually a way to parameterize the class of finite Blaschke products of degree n uh, by their critical points uh, up to a conformal invariance. And in this setting, one should understand now this Nehari Schwartz lemma, which has been uh, produced by Nehari in 1947. Okay, and it says that. If we take a holomorphic self map of the open unit disk F and a Blaschke product B of degree n, and then you assume this condition here. So you assume that if you take a critical point of this Blaschke product, uh, then the function F should also have a critical point there, and you count multiplicities. Okay. And then what you get is this inequality. Recall the left hand side is just the left hand side of the Schwartz pick inequality, but now you get an improved right hand side by the Euclidean hyperbolic derivative of this finite Blaschke product. So, this is inequality is actually a sharpening of the Schwartz pick inequality if you know something about the critical points of the self map F. And there's even an equality statement here. In this case, so if you have a point P in the interior of your unit disk, you have equality here in this inequality, and it's better to uh, write this inequality in this form. Uh, so as this quotient, and if you have that this quotient is one at just one single point inside the disk, then the function f is actually uh, a finite Blaschke product of degree n, and it's even this Blaschke product B you have prescribed up to a post composition by a disk automorphism. Okay, so there is this sharpening of the Nehari Schwartz, of the Schwartz peak lemma, and there is a way, if you look at this equality statement, how to detect whether the function f is the same as this given finite Blaschke product of degree n, and you just have to check this. Whether in this inequality, equality holds at one single point. Okay, and what we will do now is to extend this classical Schwartz, Nehari Schwartz lemma uh, in two directions. So we will it, uh, generalize it first uh, to the case of infinitely many uh, critical points, so including at least certain infinite Blaschke products. And then we will also deal with the case when this distinguished point that we look at equality uh, will be a point on the boundary. Okay, so let's first take a look at the case of infinitely many critical points. Okay, so this is now about how to detect infinite Bashke products. Um, okay, and there is the bad news right at the beginning, uh, namely that in contrast to finite Blaschke products, infinite Blaschke products are not determined up to a conformal invariance by their critical points. And it's very simple to write down examples. So what you can do is to start with a universal covering of the punctured unit disk, say at the origin. So this is the standard singular inner function. And then you look at Frostman shifts of those uh, singular inner function. And you will get universal coverings of uh, the punctured disk with puncture at other points. And by Frostman's theorem, you will get in many, many cases uh, infinite Blaschke products, but they don't have any critical points. Okay, so you cannot distinguish this, those infinite Blaschke products, for instance, from the uh, identity, because in both cases, you don't have any critical point at all. Okay, but. There is a class of plush, infinite Blaschke products where you really can get an, uh, an extension of this Nehari Schwartz lemma. And the result is here the following. So, what you do is you start now with an infinite sequence of points in the unit disk, 
and you assume this is an age infinity critical set. And this just means that there is some non-constant age infinity function which has its critical points exactly at the points of this sequence. Okay. So if you take, just take a, a finite sequence, you are back in the classical case of the Nehardi Schwartz loop. But here we allow infinite sequences. And then one can show that there is a unique Plushke product B, unique up to post composition by a disk automorphism, which has its critical points exactly also at these points of the sequence C. And then you get this inequality here, which is, which is also a sharpening of the classical Schwartz pick inequality, but now for infinite Blaschke products and infinitely many critical points. And this inequality is true for any holomorphic functions whose critical set is at least as large as the critical set you have prescribed. Okay. So you, you see, if you take for this critical set, the empty set, Okay, then when one can show that this Blaschke product is just the identity, and what you get here is exactly the schwartz pick inequality. And we even have a, uh, a result describing the cases of equality at a single point P inside the disk in this inequality. And this happens if and only if the holomorphic self map F is actually equal to this Blaschke product B again, up to post composition by a disk automorphism. Okay, so this is um, what we call a maximal Blaschke product. Yeah, so those Blaschke products that occur in this theorem too. And these set of Blaschke products or class of Blaschke products, they have a number of quite interesting, I would say, properties. So first, if you just look at the case of finite critical set C, then the corresponding maximal Blaschke products are exactly the finite Blaschke products. So every finite Blaschke product is a maximal Blaschke product, but there are many others. And, uh, and now I want to build a, a little bridge to the uh, talk of Oleg. There's a nice connection to the uh, problems in Bergman space theory about the zero sets of those functions and about the invariant subspaces. So I, I will be very brief here because it just fits here into this theorem. Uh, and much of what, what I'm going to say in the next two minutes, I, I learned from Oleg. So we call the Littlewood Paley identity, which is this thing here. It says, if you take a derivative of an H2 function, then this derivative belongs to this specific Bergman space of holomorphic functions G in the disk so that this area integral converges. Okay, that's one way to write down little bit Paley. And then uh, because H infinity is a strict subset of H2, we get this strict inclusion here. But what it turns out is using theorem two, for instance, that if you look at the critical sets of all H infinity functions, then these are exactly the zero sets of this particular Bergman space. So one way to rephrase theorem two, and this is what we really learned from Oleg, is that the zero base subspaces of this particular Bergman space can actually be identified with the set of maximal Blaschke products up to uh, post-composition by disk automorphisms. Okay, so this is somehow the same result that the set of all Blaschke products describe the zero-based subspaces of H2, for instance. But here now we have it for the Bergman space. And another connection to Bergman spaces, I just want to indicate here is that one can show that uh, the maximal Blaschke products, they have very similar properties to uh, what is called canonical devices in Bergman spaces. So uh, like this uh, well-known result of Sandberg, which uh, deals with the analytic continuability of canonical devices, exactly the same statement is somehow true for this maximal Blaschke products. So I think this is a quite interesting uh, area where many side connections actually occur. Okay, but now uh, what we do is we uh, look at this extended Nehari Schwartz lemma where we now replace this interior point P by a boundary point. Okay. 
And this uh, leads us to this following form of a rigidity result. So it says, if we now take a point P on the closure of the unit disk, so it can be a point inside the disk or the boundary, we take any maximal Blaschke product, for instance, a finite Blaschke product, and then you take a holomorphic function F so that the critical points of F are at least the critical points of your Blaschke product. And then you get this improved schwartz pick type inequality in terms of the maximal Blaschke product on the right-hand side. And if you have equality in this inequality, meaning that this quotient here is one, uh, then you get that the function f is actually a maximal Blaschke product. And you can even allow this distinguished point p to be on the boundary. And then what you need to assume is that this quotient here tends to one sufficiently fast as you go to the boundary point P. Okay. And uh, in fact, this function F is not only just one Blaschke product, it is exactly the given Blaschke product B up to post composition with the disk automatism. Okay, so a couple of remarks maybe. So if you uh, take this distinguished point P in the interior of the disk, and if you take a finite Blaschke product B, then theorem three, this is just the reformulation of the result of Nehari we have seen on the previous slide. Okay, so that's nothing new. But even in the case of a finite Blaschke product B, if you choose for the distinguished point P and or, or point on the boundary, then this is actually a boundary version and this has not been observed before to the best of our knowledge of the Nehari Schwartz lemma. So it's in the same philosophy as our boundary Schwartz pick lemma is a boundary version of the Schwartz pick lemma. And then finally, if you take any maximal Blaschke product and you take the point P again in the interior of the unit disk, then theorem three just reduces to the theorem two, which we have seen just a minute ago. Okay, so this result somehow uh, subsumes all the other results we have seen before. Okay, now maybe I say a little bit about what is behind this theorem. Okay, because you see what we also still want to understand is what is the nature of this, of, of this critical exponent two here in this error term. Yeah, this is still a bit mysterious. And to get a feeling for this, uh, we look at this theorem from a point of view of conformal geometry. Uh, just uh, the same way as Alphos extended the Schwartz pick lemma to the Alphos Schwartz lemma. So, this Euclidean hyperbolic derivative of f produces uh, a quantity which we say call lambda, and this is what people call a pseudometric. So, it's just a non negative function in the disk. And the important fact is that this pseudometric lambda now has a, a, a quantity associated to it, which is called the curvature, which is given by this compl complicated, complicated formula here. And you can compute it in the special case and what you get is minus four, no matter which point set you plug in. And then you can do the same for this Blaschke product. You get a second pseudometric mu, and you compute also the curvature of mu, and then you also see it's identical to minus four. Okay, so what does this mean is, essentially this theorem three can be seen as a statement about pseudometrics where you know something about the curvature of those pseudometrics, okay? And uh, we are interested in the case of equality so what we do have now is essentially the following problem. So we have two pseudometrics, lambda and mu, with certain curvature. Okay. And then we assume that lambda is uh, the smaller of those two metrics. So lambda is less or equal than mu, which is the same in the special case in theorem three that this schwartz pick type lemma inequality holds. Okay. And then we want to show that that if we uh, have a condition that says that lambda over mu goes to one, if you, if you pass to a boundary point in a sufficiently fast way, we want to deduce that actually you always have equality here. 
Okay, so this is somehow exactly what we have done here in theorem three. And the question is, what does sufficiently fast really mean? Okay, and what are the conditions on the curvature of lambda and mu so that a statement of this type is actually true? Okay, and if you think about this problem in this generality, you can come up with the following general rigidity result, which extends or which is the way how we prove theorem three, which is just a special case of this result. So here's this, the main result then. Okay, so the situation as before, we have two pseudometrics, lambda and mu on the disk. We assume lambda is less or equal than mu. And then here come the conditions on the curvatures. So we assume that the curvature of the smaller metric lambda, kappa lambda, is smaller than the curvature of mu. Okay, and then we just assume a little bit about the curvature of the bigger metric mu, namely that this curvature is squeezed between two negative constants. And we take the upper bound minus four just for convenience. That's the way people usually uh, choose the normalization when uh, writing down the Alfors Schwartz lemma. So we just stick here to this convention. Okay, and then the following result is true. So then if this quotient lambda over mu tends to one, if we go to a point in the closed unit disk up to a certain error term, which is written down here, then we get the conclusion we wanted to have. So that actually lambda is equal to mu. And now what is maybe interesting is that if you look at the error term, then this error term looks different from the error terms we have seen before. They are now, this number C shows up and minus C is a lower bound for the curvature of the bigger metric mu. Okay, so this means now that the exponent in the error term is actually controlled by a lower bound of the curvature of the bigger metric. This is one uh, consequence of this theorem. Okay, so if we now go back to our uh, uh, special cases we have seen before, um, then we see if we choose for this bigger metric mu just the hyperbolic metric lambda d of the disk, which we normalize so that it has constant curvature minus four. Okay, so kappa mu, the curvature is now constant minus four which means that this lower bound minus C is minus four. Then we reproduce exactly the error bound in our boundary Schwartz pick lemma. That's the number two. But now we know what this number two is. This number two is four over two and four is minus the curvature of the hyperbolic metric that shows up here in this boundary Schwartz pick lemma. Uh, okay. Yeah. So this means this number two actually can be given a geometric interpretation and you may like this interpretation or not, <laughs> but it's simply there. Okay, it's maybe a matter of taste uh, if, you, if you like this, but it, at least it gives a geometric interpretation. And okay, if you go back way back to the burns grams theorem, and if you recall that we have a uh, uh, or that we have indicated that, that one can deduce the, the, the burns Krenz theorem with this error point, point error bound three by just uh, differentiating our boundary schwartz pick lemma, then we now also have a philosophical at least interpretation of this error, error bound in the burns Krenz theorem. So the number three actually, so the real form of this error bound is not threes, but it's four over two plus one. Okay, in terms of hyperbolic geometry, if you wish. Okay, so this somehow uh, maybe also uh, gives a uh, justification why to look at those results from this perhaps more complicated point of view uh, using the theory of pseudometrics. Okay, and now I want to use the remaining time to explain a little bit what is behind this uh, rigidity result theorem four. Okay, and uh, what is behind this result is um, in spirit at least uh, 
same uh, reason what is behind uh, this result of burns and crans. So if you want to prove the result of burns and crans, you can do it by just writing down a Harnack inequality for positive harmonic functions. And uh, this is even a, an exercise in the book of Tom, Tom Ransford on uh, uh, potential theory in the complex plane. So what is lurking behind this burns crans theorem is a linear uh, Harnack inequality for positive harmonic functions. And in the same spirit, what is behind this theorem four here, it is actually a Harnack inequality, but now a nonlinear Harnack inequality, which is uh, much more complicated actually to state. Uh, but I just want to show you the result because this is the real reason why such a rigidity result actually is true. Okay, so here's the, the statement. It looks a bit technical, but actually it's quite interesting if you if you allow yourself to have, have a, a, a close look at this at this inequality here. Okay, so what does theorem five, this Harnack type inequality, tells us? Okay, so what we do is at the end of the day, we look at two conformal pseudo at, at two pseudometrics, lambda and mu, and we assume lambda is less or equal than mu, and we have the same conditions on the curvatures. Okay. And then we want to somehow look at the quotient of lambda over mu. And we look at this quotient, you see it here on the left hand side of this inequality, not on the entire unit disk, but on the on an annulus with an inner radius r and an outer radius one. So this inequality goes up all the way up to the boundary of the unit disk, but not uh, towards the origin. And then the theorem says, take any r, which at the end will be the inner radius of the, of the smaller circle of this uh, annulus. And then there is a universal constant, cr, which is positive and which depends on nothing else but r. So that if you do have those two pseudometrics, then you get an upper bound of the quotient of these two metrics on this entire annulus. If you know something about this quotient just on the inner circle of this, of this uh, annulus, and the right hand side depends or the other quantities on the right hand side do not depend anymore on lambda over on mu. So only on this universal constant CR, on the radius of the inner circle, on this lower bound of this curvature of mu, and on the point set, of course. Yeah, that's clear. Okay, so th that's a technical inequality, but you see, it, it gives you somehow an improvement. If you know something about this quotient on the inner circle, you get an inequality uh, up to the boundary of the unit disk. Okay. Uh, now you might wonder a little bit about this universal constant CR. Well, uh, the proof for theorem five actually produces such a universal constant. And I think our constant is embarrassingly bad. So what we can produce is that one can take this number e to the one minus one over r squared. Okay. But if you look at this uh, specific choice of this universal constant, you can make one observation. And the observation is, uh, well, maybe you are tempted to say uh, it would be much better if we would get this inequality of theorem five, not only on such an annulus, but maybe on the entire unit disk. Yeah. So you would like to uh, let r, the inner radius, tend to zero. So if you do this and you look at the constant CR and you let r tend to zero, you see that this universal constant goes to zero. So this means that the entire right-hand side of our inequality goes to zero and you get an inequality, which is true, but which is in a sense uh, absolutely trivial because you already started in the assumption that lambda is less equal than mu. So this doesn't give you any improvement. What you get is an improvement if you allow this uh, inner radius not to tend to zero. 
Okay, so this is somehow necessary. We cannot do any better. Okay, and maybe I give a very short sketch of this of the proof of theorem five because um, it somehow explains a little bit where this number C, so the lower bound for the curvature of kappa mu comes into the game. Because recall, this number C is responsible for the uh, critical exponent in the error term uh, in all of our results. So it might be interesting to see where this condition actually plays a role. Okay, so here are the main steps. So, okay, what we do is we look at this quotient lambda over mu, we take the logarithm of it, this makes life a little bit easier. And we want to prove at the end um, an upper bound of this auxiliary function, which we call u. Okay, and now we use the conditions on the curvature we have imposed in our theorem to check that, that this auxiliary function satisfies this specific partial differential inequality. So the curvature of mu comes into the game and the, the, the bigger metric mu also. Okay, and then we use the alpha Schwartz lemma because we have assumed that the curvature of the bigger metric mu is bounded by minus four. And this gives you a bound on the metric mu itself. So that's just the statement of the alpha Schwartz lemma. And if, if we include this statement into this partial differential equation and use the lower bound where the constant C shows up, then we end up with this partial differential equation a star for our auxiliary function. Okay. And now you see this PDE or partial differential inequality, it looks quite simple. It's not, not, not so difficult anymore. It's a linear equation, yeah. The problem comes from the blow up behavior of the right-hand side if you go to the boundary. So the goal now is to mimic uh, a standard proof of the Hopf lemma. And for this, one needs to find a kind of explicit solution to this uh, partial differential inequality. And there is such a solution. And this is uh, partly with the help of our colleague Mathematica. Uh, and well, if you work for a while, you end up with this explicit expression for an explicit solution to this inequality. And what you see here is that this constant C shows up here in this exponent. Okay, so, so that's by educated guessing and some computer work to arrive at this specific explicit, explicit solution. And then what we just now then do is using the maximum principle essentially to show that if we add to our auxiliary function u, which we want to produce an upper bound, a, a, a small perturbation in terms of this explicit solution. So we look at u plus epsilon vr. And then one can show that on the annulus, at least, this function has no positive locks local maximum. And then we arrive using the maximum principle at an upper bound for our auxiliary function u, at least on this, on this annulus. Uh, the last but not least step is actually the most complicated one. Uh, because here we have to deal with the problem that we assume that our function u might have points where it takes on the value minus infinity. This is where this additional zeros of lambda come in. And this makes the proof actually much more difficult, but it is necessary to get the full statement here. Okay, so uh, I think this was essentially everything I wanted to tell you today. So I thank you for your attention and yeah. Thanks. Thank you indeed, Oli. That's thank you, Oli, for a wonderful talk. Any questions or comments for Oli? Yeah, I'd like uh, Oli to, to ask you in, in, say, in your theorem four, uh, you were requiring um, the point Z to approach the point P, right? Uh, no, yes. well, it was. Yeah, so it is again that uh, you would have the same result uh, if you only have a, a, a sequence approaching to the point B. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
just the long wall sequence. I mean, this is actually true. Uh, I mean, there is a there is a version of the burns grants theorem I showed you at the very mm -hmm. beginning, uh, where you can show that also in the burns grants theorem, it, it suffices if you just approach this boundary point uh, along one sequence, but in a non-tangential way. Okay, uh -huh. and, and this is because the absolute value here is in the outside. I and see. In our, in, in our theorem, like in this interior Schwartz pick lemma, the absolute value is here. I see. Okay. And, and this means that we can allow unrestricted approach along mm. just one sequence. Yeah, I see. Hmm. For the maximum blush gap products that you mentioned, is there kind of intrinsic uh, description of them, say based on zeros? I have no idea, actually. I mean, the point here is really we prescribe those blush gap products by the critical points. And mm. um, there is, uh, I think there is, I mean, for, for finite blush gap products, I think there is a paper by Christian Glader where he computes uh, the Blaschke product in terms of the given critical points. So he has an algorithm, you, you, you plug in the critical points, but only finitely many, and he outputs the corresponding finite Blaschke product. Um, okay. But I mean, uh, so this is not really what we would like to see because the more interesting case is, of course, that of an infinite Blaschke product here, right? And I don't know of any, any way to uh, convert a maximal pro Blaschke product to a, say, its standard form in terms of an infinite product. Hmm. Okay, I didn't know that because you meant the theorem that you mentioned, the last one was by Zakuri. Yep. It's kind of existence theorem. They don't provide yeah, any. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this this paper of uh, actually Heinz had the same result. Mm -hmm. They they use a kind of uh, a fixed point theorem, Brouwer fixed point theorem, to give a non-constructive proof of of their result. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's non-constructive. There's nothing here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but there's this paper by Christian Glader. I can send you a reference if you wish, where he has put an uh, an algorithm. That computes actually these things. Yeah. Yeah, please. By the way, Zakari Said, he he is a communication engineer and then mathematician. Oh, okay. Because all well, back to 25 years ago, I was in the electrical engineering school and he was in the communication engineering school. So and then he went to mathematics and then I, I don't have news about him anymore. I know he was professor of math somewhere in the US, then no further news. Any further comments or questions for Oli on this beautiful topic? If not, let's thank him again. <laughs>